Hey everybody, what's up? It's your friend Chase here at the Chase Jarvis Live Show on Creative Live. You know this show where I sit down with amazing humans and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams and career hobby in life. Our guest today is Harley Finkelstein. You probably know Harley's work. If you don't know his name, he is the president of Shopify. And why would I have this guest on right now here as we're emerging from a global pandemic? It's because now is the best time in the history of the world to start your own business on the internet. Uh, the platform that they've built over there is incredible, but mostly I wanted ha uh, Harley on the show today to talk to you about how you can take advantage of this particular moment in time to either start or advance that side hustle, the psychology around how we spend our money and time, the opportunity to provide equity and opportunity for underserved communities is the greatest all time history of the world right now. This conversation with Harley is, uh, it's near to my heart. It's special. It underscores the opportunities for entrepreneurs and the, uh, the entrepreneur mindset to have disproportionate impact right now. So I'm gonna get out of the way and here's my conversation with Harley of Shopify. All right, Harley, welcome back to the show. For is this time number two or number three? Do you remember? Second time, Se second time, second yeah, second time. Yeah. Great to have I you. Think back I think I get like a I get a gold watch on the third time. <laughs> I think. But uh, Chase, thank you so much for having me back. It was really fun to do it in person with you. Now, of course, we're doing it virtually, but I'm. It's always an honor to be on your show. Well, it is a treat to watch where you and the Shopify team have come, not just uh, since our last show together, um, but from the very, very beginning. Uh, I will remind our viewers that you and I have been friends for, I think it's coming up on like a decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember right. fondly sitting around a campfire uh, at Lake Tahoe where you and Toby, the the uh, CEO of Shopify, were talking about this big vision that you had and you were asking questions about how photographers thought about online commerce and stores. And just to think of where you have taken this company and where, of course, in a pandemic and ultimately post-pandemic world, the world of shopping has completely transformed. So for those folks that the half a dozen who are listening or watching and do not know you and your background, um, give us the, you know, give us the 60 second overview and, and then we can start to rebuild from that campfire in Tahoe to where you are today. Nice place to start a story as a campfire in Lake Tahoe, I suppose. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm the I'm currently the president of Shopify. I've been with Shopify now for uh, about 11 years or so, uh, which is uh, about a third of my life. I'm, I'm in my mid 30s, so Shopify is really the first job I've ever had. Um, but I started as a merchant. I was I've been an entrepreneur since I was a kid. Last time on the show, we talked about my first uh, sort of hustle, which was I wanted to be a DJ. No one would hire me, so I started my own DJ company. And I've been using entrepreneurship uh, effectively since that since that since I was 13 to solve different problems. Uh, and in 2006, I was in law school. Uh, I needed to make some money, and I ended up meeting Toby serendipitously at a at a sort of startup event in Ottawa, uh, where I'd moved uh, to go to law school, and ended up becoming one of the first merchants on Shopify. And what I what Shopify did for me was it effectively gave me independence. It meant that I didn't have to drop out of school to continue my studies. I was able to concurrently uh, go to law school and business school and also run a business. And I practiced law for all of uh, ten months uh, in two thousand eight. Hated it. Thought it was like the worst <laughs> worst way for me to spend my time. Not for everyone, but for me, it was the worst way to spend my time. And called Toby and and asked him if I can join him and and uh, a couple others who were all engineers and help build this company. And uh, today we have, you know, one more than 1.7 million merchants on the platform. Uh, about 9% of all e-commerce in the U.S. goes through Shopify. If you were to pretend that we were a retailer, we would be the second largest online retailer in America after Amazon. And, uh, and it feels more so than ever before that mission to sort of help entrepreneurs spread entrepreneurship feels more important than ever before right now. That is, you just... You know, your last point there was the laser beam that I want to focus on for a moment here and why I wanted you back on the show because, you know, we keep hearing in the media, we keep talking, you know, at these, you know, I just had a, a two friends over social distance, sitting 12 feet away from each other outside under heat lamps here in Seattle, where it's still a little bit chilly, mm -hmm. just talking about, you know, this, the idea of normal and what's different and what's changed. And, 
you know, that is, it seems to dominate the media, it dominates individual conversations, it dominates the thought patterns that I'm having as a creator and an entrepreneur. Um, you know, what are you leaving behind? What do you, what's, what's new and what can you, you know, how do you reorient for a different future than the trajectory we were on just a couple of years ago? And core to this is what you uh, and Toby and the team over there at, at, at Shopify have built. And it is the future of buying stuff is forever changed. And the future of opportunity and the opportunity specifically for autonomy for so many people who are watching and listening right now is has dramatically accelerated. So obviously you couldn't see the future. You didn't have a crystal ball, but there's some element of what you've been building all along that if you've been digging your ditch, this is the way I talk about it. As entrepreneurs, we're digging a ditch and you can either dig a ditch trying to chase the market, which is a losing proposition because the market moves mm -hmm. faster than your shovel usually, or you can just dig the, the ditch of the vision that you have. And ultimately the market, if you've done your job as an entrepreneur and listen to your customers, then the, you're digging a ditch in a direction that the market invariably will come around a number of times in your career to engulf what it is that you're doing. And that's precisely what's happened. You didn't have a crystal ball, but how did you know where it was going? And now that you're there, what do you see? I think we saw in the early stages of the company that for the most part, entrepreneurship um, is deeply rooted in so many of our stories. M you know, my, my father's an immigrant to Canada. When he came here in 1956, his parents became entrepreneurs. They didn't call it that, but that, that's effectively what they did. They started a little business selling eggs at a farmer's market. And they did that, you know, until my grandfather passed away for like 65 years. Entrepreneurship is so baked into the, the fabric of society. And so there, there, there's never been this uh, a surprise that people want to start business that want to create something from nothing. However, it was very inaccessible. Even my grandfather, if you think about that story of, of a Hungarian immigrant during the Hungarian Revolution immigrating to Canada, the amount of risk that he had to take to get this little, effectively a table and, and inventory to sell these eggs to consumers he, he had to leverage and mortgage his entire life. So the cost of failure of entrepreneurship has historically been really high. And then you add on to that, a lot of the technology that came out of the 90s, yeah, it was great technology. I mean, it, it really did allow for this democratization of distribution of retail, but it was out of reach for most people. If you, did, if you were not an engineer and you didn't have a couple million dollars, it was impossible for you to build a beautiful, scalable online business. And so... That premise was what if we gave the same tools that traditionally what the only the, the biggest companies were able to afford, what if we gave them to everybody? What would that look like? And over time, we've been increasing this, the supply of these entrepreneurs, these direct-to-consumer brands, these small businesses, and, and help giving them a home. Um, and then uh, sort of simultaneously, the demand side is the consumer side. Consumers also, and especially during the pandemic, we can talk about the pandemic in a second, but consumers began in a very different way to start voting with their wallets to support these independent brands. And so I think what you're seeing today, uh, as we sort of zoom out for a second, is a complete paradigm shift in retail and commerce. And it's driven by the fact that people on the, on the supply side, anyone that has a great product or a great service can now access a global consumer base at very affordable pricing. Uh, and then on the demand side, consumers would prefer to buy Allbirds and Bombus and Tommy John and Kylie Cosmetics and Gymshark and all these companies that didn't even exist five or six years ago. And so the meeting of the supply and demand, I think, is what's creating this incredibly, frankly, inspiring retail landscape and environment that we have not seen since, you know, the baker used to sell his own bread or her own bread and the cobbler used to sell their own shoes. Um, it, 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 it's a very exciting time. And, and yes, we're in, a, we're in the middle of a global pandemic right now, and there's a lot to be anxious about. But there's a lot also to be optimistic about. And, and in many ways, there is no profession or self-identity that is more resilient than entrepreneurship. And I think that's the reason why you've seen entrepreneurs, people that self-identify, people that have entrepreneurial instincts, do quite well in the middle of a global pandemic uh, in a way that I think is surprising to a lot of people. Underscore that point by the fact that I've known so many people in this time period you know, we've heard the stories of great businesses are often built or started in the downturn. 
And, you know, at least as we check in with the creative live community, we just did a survey um, out to a couple million people and the answers we got back for the tools they want and what, how creative life can help them just they basically resonated with exactly what you just talked about there are people who look at this as their full-time job but so many people now are doing this as a side hustle there's something like i can't quote canadian statistics i will apologize mm -hmm. in advance but 70 million americans have a side hustle where they're making money outside of their primary occupation and you've got to think of this as you know hugely inspired, spurred on, made possible by these, these online tools. So the question is how much of your business of Shopify's universe, or as, uh, you know, an online retail expert, if we just, you know, couch your experience in that title for just a second, do you see this, you know, more people having these side hustles or stores on the side of what they're actually doing? Or is this the, the fact that there are so many tools and this is available and affordable and uh, an, an easy option to set up in a matter of, you know, an hour, does that mean we're going to pull more people into these of uh, the hundred percent self-employed universe? What's the, mm -hmm. what's the trend that you see? Well, let's just, I mean, let's, let's use, let's use, let's use some us numbers and, and stats here. So in Q3 2020, the U.S. Census Bureau has stated that there were more business registrations in that quarter, Q3 2020, uh, than any other quarter since 2004. At the same time, if you look at Google Trend Reports, just for the term start a business, you are seeing a complete spike in that uh, as well relative to the last 15 or 20 years, the highest spike uh, proportionally on, on, on a Google Trend Report. So there's no question there's an appetite for it. And you think about well, why are more people doing it? Well, yes, it is easier. The tools are better. But also, I think what people are realizing is that they want to have control of their own livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And if they if they have a job, but they now have reduced hours because of the pandemic, they're looking to supplement their income. If they've lost their job, they're looking to replace their income. But what I actually see, what I see, and, and again, this is a little bit of a future, um, you know, foreshadowing for what we think we'll see in the future is, what if everyone that has a hobby, everyone that makes something that is of value to the world, what if every one of those people commercialized that hobby? What if everyone that made, uh, my wife just made me lunch today. She makes like the most delicious chicken soup. Like <laughs> Lindsay's actually an ice cream entrepreneur. But what if Lindsay also decided to commercialize her chicken soup that she makes? And it takes like four days and she uses like eight different chickens and she has these secret recipes. And what if everyone that has a hobby, everyone that has uh, a workshop, a woodshed, uh, a little station in their garage where they make cool stuff, um, people that are packed, my, my grandmother has been making our kids these beautiful blankets. What if everyone one of those people replaced the term hobby with venture, with entrepreneurial, small business, something of that nature, what would be the end result? And so I think, I think it's coming from both angles. Now, yes, it is easier now to do so. It is less, the risk aversion uh, or, or the risk tolerance you need is lower. The cost of failure is lower, but that means that a lot more people are trying it. And so actually building a very, you know, successful business is also quite complicated. And it's and and we shouldn't glamorize entrepreneurship. It's still a difficult okay. task. Oh, to do. Dark circles under exactly. my eyes. That's right. Like <laughs> and, and, and I'm a card carrying member of that club that, you know, I've had a couple of really cool businesses that I've built, but I've also had a ton of failure. And 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 you know, it, most of the entrepreneurs around me, yourself included, that I'm friends with, we've had a lot of failures. Yeah. So it's not an easy thing to do. The difference is that if you try something now and it works, you can scale it and you can build, you know, Ben Francis, who I think you know from Gymshark, uh, I think you met him through Build a Business. That's a billion dollar company. It didn't exist seven years ago. And now that is being looked at as a real competitive threat to the likes of Nike and Under Armour. I mean, that is, that is mind blowing that in such a short period of time, this scale can be built. So if you try something and there's scalability, if there's an opportunity to scale, you can do so. The flip side is if it doesn't work, you also can try three different other things and see if one of those things are going to be uh, be successful. So the way that we think about Shopify is that we want as many people uh, that have ideas in the shower in the morning to try their hand at entrepreneurship, make it really, really accessible. We know that not all will succeed, but the idea is that the ones that do succeed will eventually scale faster and more effectively than any of the predecessor companies that have been built frankly, in the history of the world. And so that I think is what has changed now. And, and I also think that this connotation of entrepreneur um, 
you know, for a long time, my wife was not, Lindsay would not call herself an entrepreneur because she just didn't feel like that was, that was a brand that, that she, that she was, that she was able to self-identify with. And I think we're now making it more accessible, inviting more people in to say, Hey, look, this entrepreneurship thing, it's not just a great way to make some money. It's also a great way to self-actualize, to share your gifts with the world, to create independence for your family. Yeah. I, those last, you know, those last few bullets there. And I think understanding how Lindsay identifies and understanding that so many people now can actually own that moniker or at least rent it, as you said, and give things a try. And if it doesn't work great, and if it does work, then, you know, you have an opportunity to scale something that was once not scalable. Um, how much, how much value do you all place on the, con the concept of an identity? Because it seems like, you know, when I used to ask people like, what do you do? And as I was trying to you know, build and conceive of creative live, like how can, how can we help these people? And it just occurred to me how strong this concept of identity really is in driving human actualization and, um, accelerating potential. And you know, sort of, if you, if you call yourself these things that that is a, that, that actually frames so much of how you operate in the world. And, and then the contrary, for example, if someone wants to say, uh, quit smoking and they say, I'm a smoker who's trying to quit versus because, you know, their identity is couched in, in smoker versus identity in like, I'm a health nut who's, you know, managing, you know, addictions that distract from that, you know, there's just a flipping of that. So as at, 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 you know, again, you're coming from the Shopify perspective, but I, I look at you as just having a, 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 a wider purview you're you know you know so much about online selling and and entrepreneurship because you have 1.7 million entrepreneurs as your customers so how much how, what role does identity play and how do you feel like that has been shaped or reshaped across since the last time we talked maybe a year ago when the number of customers were you, you, you last time it was 600,000 and here we are at 1.7 million. And that yeah, was it's almost, like... three, it's almost three times what, what it was <laughs> last time we spoke, which is, which is amazing, which is why actually, you know, there's a lot of really great stats that I, I love to quote. Um, you know, our, our revenue is doubling. Our GMV is doubling. We're now the second largest retailer in America. We're 9% of total league. All those things are really cool. But the actual number that I actually, that I, I, I by far, if I was going to get a, 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 a data point tattooed somewhere, the number that I actually think is the most important is the fact that every 28 seconds, a new entrepreneur on Shopify gets their first sale. And the reason that I believe in that, that I think it's so important is because that moment when you get your first sale, that moment is when, in meant for many of us, everything changes. That is the moment where your identity changes, where your self-confidence changes, where your audacity changes. You now have been brought into this new box, this new area of opportunity. And, and, and Sky is absolutely the limit to that. So I, I know if you, if you were to go to social media and you would ask the sort of the Twitter philosophers, is identity important? You would get two different schools of thought. One school of thought would be never be attached to any identity or have very you know lean identity, very light identity, so you can swap those things out. But the identity of an entrepreneur to me has been so valuable because it colors in a very positive, constructive way every decision in my life. It colors how I parent and how I treat my uh, relationship with Lindsay. Uh, it colors how I learn how to play a new sport like mountain biking or tennis. It, it colors how I do my job as a, the president of Shopify. It even colors how I have relationships with people that I deeply care about. To me, this idea of the entrepreneur identity is simply a very resourceful way and a very um, uh, high impact way of solving problems. And that's the reason why I think, you know, you're, you're in the same boat, you and I've talked about this, but when you, when your Venn diagrams of your personal interest and your professional interest overlap, that my friend, that is life's work. Mm -hmm. And if you can find that, where the thing that you would do if you never had to work again, or or just you know you you woke up on a Saturday morning, want to make fun. If that thing you would do on a Saturday morning is the same thing that you you feel you have to do on a Monday morning, there's nothing better than that. And when you talk to entrepreneurs, you talk to the merchants on Shopify, or you talk to Chase or or, or me. You, you get that sense. I feel that I'm doing my life's work. And the way I know it is because those things are totally lined up. And I think Shopify really is, 
is the answer to this, you know, is the answer to this question, which is what would happen if everybody who wanted to or needed to were able to start a business? What would that look like? And I think you create equality that way. I think you 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 have a more level playing field. I think you get people to be a lot more creative and move away from a traditional nine to five that people wait to retire from to then go and do their life's work. They can do their life's work during their their life. That I think is why entrepreneurship is such a powerful concept. It's just it's crazy the emergence of it. You know, the entrepreneur used to once mean you went to Silicon Valley and raised a round of, of financing. And now that it's um, made its way into every sort of nook and cranny of popular culture, you talked about it as an identity around being able to solve problems and start new things. And uh, I, I truly think that's part of the, the, the uh, why I asked the question, because it's almost like it's a sensibility uh a quality in approach to life. And it, you know, it happens to have a manifestation in business, but this idea of I can solve problems, I can iterate and test. And um, I don't know, it just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing, right? It and is. actually, you know, I'm glad you mentioned Silicon Valley for a second, because one thing that I think most people completely misunderstand about an entrepreneurial journey is that everybody's definition of success is totally different. I had this really cool thing that happened to me this summer. I was on a TV show. I was uh, uh, on, on Discovery Channel. It was called I Quit. I was one of the, the three stars of the show, uh, quote unquote. And uh, and what we did is we, the, the whole concept of the show that we did with Discovery was we would take people that had side hustles, had full-time jobs that they didn't really love, but they had these side hustles. And we would work with them throughout the course of, of 10 episodes. And we would try to convince them to quit their full-time jobs and pursue their, their side hustles. And when you, so I went, I mean, this was filmed two years ago, pre-pandemic, but it aired uh, summer 2020. But so I got a chance to spend a lot of time in person with each of these companies. And when you ask them why they started, every single one of them had a completely different answer. And none of them was, I wanted to make a boatload of money. One of them grew up, uh, his name is uh, Mike D. He's a barbecue sauce company. He lives in Durham, North Carolina. And he had never met anyone that ever had a family business. And this idea that his daughters would have a place if they wanted to, to go into as this, you know, this, this opportunity, this potential opportunity and have that flexibility to have a family business to go into. That's why he started. In other case, there was a company that made these beautiful Brazilian chocolates called Brigadeiros out of New York City. And they just were obsessed with sharing this delicious chocolate with the world. And so one thing that gets, I think, missed about entrepreneurship is that the goal of entrepreneurship for some, maybe build build a, a hundred billion dollar you know company and take it public and 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 raise capital and do all those things. For others, it's just a way so they don't have to work at a job they don't love, or it's a way for them to inspire their children, or it's a way to give their children opportunities that they never had. And that is why I think the the term and the brand of entrepreneurship is so powerful because it's an accelerant for any one specific ambition, and all those ambitions are going to be different. What's the ratio of ultra small? I just, I, I'm, I have a hope to the answer to this question, but I'm not attached to it. Um, what is the relationship between the number of small solopreneurs or, or ultra small business? Um, I don't remember the, I think the, the SBA has a term for this in the US. I don't remember what it is right now, but on your platform, if it, it's just as a data point relative to the massive stores, is it, you know, is it 50, 50, is it 90, 10, you know, how, what's the relationship between mom and pop, small one single digit person companies to mega brands? It is, um, it is by far the vast majority of Shopify merchants are sole proprietorships. I don't know if that's the term you're looking for, but yeah. uh, the vast majority are these independent single person businesses. And the reason that I talk about, you know, Allbirds or Bombas or, or Gymshark or any or Fashion Nova, any of these companies is, is not because um, those are the ones that, that we care most about. In fact, just the opposite. The reason that those, I, I raise those brands is because it's important for people to know that all of those brands started in some case at their mom's kitchen table or at a coffee shop. They started as sole proprietorships and have been able to scale quickly in a way that business has not traditionally been able to scale in the history of commerce, which is effectively the history of, of currency. Um, 
But this idea that every 28 seconds, a brand new entrepreneur gets their first sale, that to me is really why, why I show up every day. That's really why I do my work. Now, what's also fascinating is that these very large established brands like Heinz Ketchup or Chipotle or Lindt Chocolate or Herman Miller or Stetson, um, what, ha what has happened in the last couple of years is we've started to see these mega brands come to Shopify as well and begin to sell direct to consumer. And when you, when you sort of ask these questions as to, you know, why Shopify? Why are you thinking about doing this now? What's happened is these smaller direct to consumer kind of startup brands have made competition uh, and created this competitive landscape such that the bigger brands actually need to act like entrepreneurs as well. And in some of these companies, what you see is it's fascinating. In some com some companies come to us and say, okay, great, we want to bring our massive, you know, uh, brand onto Shopify and we want to participate in you to participate in RFP process. It's going to be a six month sales cycle. And we just we say no, we we don't do that stuff. We don't we're not gonna go golfing with you or or have steak dinners with you to convince you to, that's just not our model. However, we will give you the software in which you can build your own store. And it's it seems to be that in a lot of these cases, there is someone in those companies inside of these big CPGs um, who is an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur who comes to us and sometimes just puts in their down their their personal credit card and just signs up the business for a Shopify store. And it's cool to see actually some of these companies not only act entrepreneurial, but have success as being entrepreneurs. Heinz Ketchup is selling direct to consumer. I mean, like, you know, uh, Schwinn Bicycle is selling direct to consumer. These are companies that realize the future of retail is completely different than anything that they've been working on. And they want to enter this sort of the same strategy and the same model as, you know, that solo entrepreneur in Durham, North Carolina. All right. I want to simultaneously close one chapter of our conversation and open another just based on what you just said. So the, 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 my hope behind, behind the, the, the question, the prompt there was that it, it was going to be the case that, you know, it's 90, it's probably like 99 to one, the number of solopreneurs to sort of mega brands. Yeah, In terms of a number of stores. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's vastly uh, the solopreneurs. And so the message to those listening and watching right now is you, you're not alone. Like this is a, this is a time in history where the tools that you have at your fingertips are the same or better than the tools that so many of these mega brands had and as evidenced by them coming to use these tools. And so if you were ever hesitant about your ability to do this, know that 99 out of 100 or whatever the rough, I'm, I'm, I'm putting mm -hmm. stats in your mouth. So I'll be careful to qualify that. But imagine 99 out of 100 people who are doing this on platforms uh, and Shopify and platforms like it are just like you. And so yeah. you're not alone. Not, not just that, you know, people are going to think that I set you up for this, but but I, this, there's no setup here. I started the conversation by saying we, would, if we were a retailer, we'd be the second largest retailer. Yeah. Uh, that's a cool flex. That's not the reason why I care about it. The reason I care about it is because when we go in to negotiate payment rates uh, on, on, like, on merchant accounts, so the ability to transact credit cards or shipping labels, the shipping companies or capital rates or fulfillment rates. When we walk into these negotiations, we do so as if we are the second largest retailer, bigger than Best Buy and bigger than Target and bigger than Walmart.com. And that's because of that's our scale. But rather than keep those economies of scale for ourselves, we can actually give those to anyone who's signing up for Shopify. So in terms of, you know, not only are you not alone, but for the first time maybe ever, um, the deck is beginning to be further stacked in your favor as a first time entrepreneur because the rate you're paying on payments or your ability to access capital or your ability to do two day affordable shipping is effectively the same as if you were a very well established retailer. And that never happened before. Yeah. It's incredibly, incredibly cool. And again, the reason. I'm going to just go back to the top of the hour here. The reason that I wanted you to come back on the show is because in the last year, online retail and every creator and entrepreneur's dream of selling their products out in, in the wild to random buyers in whether it's across the town, the country or the world is more available to you now than ever before. So yeah. that's the why. That's the why you're on this show today. And so thank you for representing that. That all that you're not alone if you're out there thinking about, man, I'm really wondering if there's no downside to putting the the quilts that you're making on the internet and trying to get a sale, even if it's just to fund the next yarn purchase or 
to put your books or to, you know, our, our mutual friend, Ryan holiday sells, you know, he's got a great store at the daily stoic.com mm-hmm. where he sells, you know, limited edition books. And I just got his, more. he just sent me his leather bound one. It's beautiful. It's yeah. like, it comes in this beautiful box and it's leather, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And that's through Shopify as an example. So again, I, I want to put an exclamation point on, on that. And then I want to open up a new conversation with, or a new topic focused on something you just said a moment ago, which is in my notes here at a place where I wanted to take the conversation. So thank you for the perfect segue. And it's to be able to, as a creator or entrepreneur, have a direct relationship to the customer in a world that you historically have not. And you, you cited the, you know, Schwinn bicycles and all these most consumer packaged goods and most brands that you talk about historically have had to have a distribution channel where there were middlemen and women taking a cut and owning the relationship with the customer. And now that's arguably one of the most valuable attributes of not only do you get the scale, it's sort of like Amazon had AWS. And so now as a, as a web person, I can go put my website on you know, get the same scalability that some mega brand has, but now I can also own the relationship with the, the thousand true fans to cite Kevin Kelly or mm-hmm. the people who most love whatever it is that I'm doing, or you who are listening, uh, are doing right now. So pontificate, drop some, drop mm-hmm. some knowledge on me around this, the ability to have a direct relationship with your fans, followers, and customers. A quick retail history lesson. Um, this idea of a direct relationship from maker to consumer was retail. And that was the town square of, of the olden days. You went to the town square where all the merchants were, and you as a consumer bought your bread and your shoes and all the things that you needed to buy. And then around uh, the late 1800s, 1876, this guy named John Wanamaker in Philadelphia created the first department store. And this idea was he is going to go ahead and curate a bunch of different products under one roof. And you as the consumer, you can go and you can buy shoes and bread and everything you need in one single place. And that was the introduction of intermediation, of of this idea of having an intermediary between the maker and the consumer. And for the most part, retail has basically been the same since Wanamaker's was created. It's been a lot of intermediation. And... There's a lot of value to that. I mean, one of the things that you get as a as a maker or creator uh, with an intermediary is that they are responsible for bringing consumers to your products. But you are not actually, you are renting customers. You are renting the business from that intermediary. The customer belongs to the intermediary, not the maker, not the brand. And the reason that that was valuable from a consumer perspective was not every maker, the baker couldn't put up stores all over the world. So by the, for the baker to sell their bread to different stores in a wholesale relationship and then have the intermediary resell it to the end consumer, it was valuable for all parties. Now, there is an agency problem. The agency problem is in some cases, these intermediaries said, well, wait a second, we can just make our own bread. We don't need to use the baker's bread. We have the consumer. We have this distrib- these distribution uh, centers, which are stores. Uh, we can just do it ourselves. So one issue is the, the agency problem. The second issue, though, is that there was no choice. Distribution happened through stores. The reason that you and I would go to a Best Buy or a GameStop 20, 30 years ago is because we couldn't go direct to the game maker. We couldn't go to the, directly to the TV maker. We had to go to one of these, these department stores. And then the internet happens, e-commerce becomes a reality, and it just takes a sledgehammer to distribution. It democratizes distribution. And it says anyone that has a computer and an internet connection can now access a global consumer base. And so this idea of of direct-to-consumer being this fad, it's not a fad. It's the way retail should have always been. It's just that it was difficult to do distribution. It was difficult to access a global consumer base and e-commerce allows for that. And so what you're seeing now is going back to the earlier part where I talk about all these retailers, excuse me, all these merchants, all these makers were in the town square. Well, the digital town squares of today are social media and it's marketplaces and it's your own website. And it's even some 
physical in person in real life stuff too, like your physical store. And so I think what a, a maker or a creator or a merchant needs to think about today is where are my consumers spending their time? What is the digital town square or the proverbial main street in 2021? And what we're trying to build for them is we're actually fairly channel agnostic. Yes, with Shopify, you get this great online store, but you can also sell on Instagram and you can sell on Pinterest. You can sell on walmart.com and you can sell on, you can advertise on TikTok and you can sell anywhere you want online or offline. Um, but what's happened is that because the relationship between the creator and the maker and the consumer is now direct, it means that from the consumer perspective, the experience is better. From the maker perspective, they get to keep the entirety of their margin and they own the consumer relationship. So, I mean, you can just you know peruse any any you know magazine or any blog uh, that, that talks about retail or commerce, and you'll see countless articles around the innovation that is direct to consumer. But direct to consumer is just, it's what it's always been. It's what it should have always been, except that at some point it got too difficult to do distribution and now it's not. And so it is not surprising to me. I think in the future, every brand will either be a direct to consumer brand or will have a major piece of their retail operations be direct to consumer. And the best example I can give you is Heinz ketchup, which nobody ever thought that they would buy Heinz directly <laughs> from Heinz to go or Heinz at home. Uh, they, it's a grocery store item and you will still buy it in a grocery store. But if I know that my family is obsessed with ketchup, I can just go buy direct from Heinz and I can buy a case of 12 ketchups or mustards. And now I have it. And the experience is really actually quite great to buy directly from them. So that I think is, is, is not only a better business model, but it also takes care of the agency problem whereby um, the business model of great companies like Shopify, I think, uh, and other, others like us, we are only successful when the merchants are successful. That is very different than what you would see in an inter with an intermediary or department store where the, the relationship can be somewhat adversarial. Yeah. Undoing that adversary, the distribution. I, I, I remember even maybe a decade ago, uh, I had some insight into Nike's ops and their, the relationship that they had with their distributors was very, it was very tense because the distributor, sure. like somebody is as large as Nike. Right. And when they switched to go direct and then, you know, not that, you know, not, 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 not that long ago, mm -hmm. it was, it was very controversial and their, yes. all of their distributors were up in arms and, and then they created the Nike stores and the distributors or the other, like, you know, let's just use Foot Locker for an example. Yeah. I, I know nothing about Foot Locker, but as an example, how can you compare the experience of buying a pair of Nikes in the Nike store versus in the Foot Locker store? You walk into the Nike store, it's a museum, it's a carnival, it's an experience, it's rich and interesting. And, and the, the, the art on the wall and the music that is playing and, and the, the education of the staff is so, so great. Compare that to buying it from some random retailer that sells Nike across and, and other products. As a consumer, you're not going to feel that's a better, a better experience. You're always going to go the Nike route. And I think that is a great example of, of where it's going. Retail is going to get much better from a consumer. It's also going to get much better for the brands. I think that's uh, a key takeaway. If you're thinking about this, you know, for your own world, like, do you want to own that relationship? Do you want to control it and control with a small C because, you know, ultimately you're, you're, you have the opportunity to influence, but you get to have a relationship where your fans and customers get to directly tell you what they think of the experience, how they would like it shaped. And that, at, like, that's a, a, a flywheel almost. You create something for your, your thousand true fans and they give you feedback and then you tweak that like that is a relationship and a, a very powerful, I think, vehicle that cements the experience and the relationship and so many of the things we've been talking about. I and that, that thousand, that thousand true fr fans blog post, which I, I reference all the time. I think it's an amazing piece of, 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 of understanding of how the world operates. If you're starting a business today, your goal should not be to sell a million dollars in 12 months. Maybe that's a side goal, but imagine there are a thousand people who truly love your brand, love your story, love your products. I was talking to Rebecca Minkoff, who's one of our merchants on Shopify five days ago, like uh, late last week. And she said that in the early days of Rebecca Minkoff, when she had, I think her first bag that she got famous for was called uh, the, um, the morning after bag. Uh, and 
the reason that she knew she had something there was she was she would just go on different blogs and and listen and 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 watch how people were talking about the bag. And at some point, she just went on and said, "Hey, what do you want next?" And they're like, "Well, can you change these colors?" And Rebecca Minkoff, who's sort of the modern day fashion the American fashion house, one of the most successful brands in America, um, the the way that was built was not by building a hundred million dollar business per se right at the gates. It was actually built around getting feedback from a very small pool of very loyal brand people who really cared about her product. I love that way of thinking about building. I vote with my wallet direct across the pandemic. And I would say before, but it was radically accelerated and amplified when the pandemic hit. Who do I want to see not just survive, but thrive in a post pandemic world? I doubled down on the local restaurants. I mean, I take out meal kits, whatever they were giving you, right? Like literally anything they were selling, right. I was buying and yeah, me too. because I was in a position to, to do that, to support them. And I understand and acknowledge that others may have not been, cause this mm -hmm. has been a really, really tough go. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we now have an opportunity to vote with our dollars. And I'm just curious what your lens is on the future of that as a primary mechanism for economic growth, for um, equality, equity. Um, you know, I, I invested in a lot of art by from the BIPOC community uh, mm -hmm. across the pandemic as well. And I'm just curious to, to hear your view on how important or unimportant, if I've got this wrong, the opportunity to vote with your wallet is whether you are on the consumer side, which is the side that I'm articulating, that, mm -hmm. articulating this point of view from, or if you're a, a shopkeeper, a merchant, or you want to put your stuff out there in the world and make something for your 1000 true fans. What you're hitting on is unequivocally a new thing that has happened through COVID or accelerated through COVID that uh, will continue long after the, the, the pandemic is over, which is that Wherever you live, small town, big city, our communities, I think we have all realized and it's become so apparent that the reason our communities are interesting, uh, they have character, they have culture, it's a lot, to, a lot of that has to do with the local small businesses. You may laugh that the dry cleaner doesn't add culture, but if you have a relationship and, and a dynamic and a friendship, uh, you know, even casually with a dry cleaner, it does make it interesting. Oh, I, I, know I, I will just use that as an example. Quan is my, my right. dry cleaner. And I, every time I walk in there, I'm like, what's up? How's it, you know, we have a relationship right. and totally. sure it's, it's reasonably superficial. Cause we're not like, I don't know. No, you're not really that friends. Well. We're but, not but, but by the way, that, that right there, Chase, that's what makes communities and cities and towns interesting. Those dynamics, those micro, you know, as superficial as they may be, those micro those micro dynamics you have with all the people that operate the small businesses, the the bodegas, the nail salons, the coffee shops, the restaurants in your community. And I think we as as humans who live in these communities, we just realized if we want our communities to be as interesting after the pandemic as before, and maybe even more so, we have to support them. So this this thing has happened where we've all decided whenever possible. Um, and I'll, I'll, give, I'll, I'll add a caveat to that, which I'll explore in a second. Whenever possible, we want to buy from local businesses. We want to buy from our, 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 the people that operate these small businesses in our towns. And I don't think that's going away. I think what's actually happening is for a long time, it was actually fairly difficult to, um, I, I don't know, but you know, your town, but, but here in Ottawa, some of these restaurants that I love and I, my wife and I are foodies, um, they didn't do delivery. They didn't do meal kits. They actually kind of were pretty shitty at, at, at things like even taking reservations. Yeah. But what has happened is the pandemic has created this catalyst where they all have to figure out how do I digitalize? How do we do meal kits? How do we do takeout? And so they've actually made it easier for us as consumers to vote with our wallets to support them. So I, what you were saying is absolutely going to be the case. And we, we've done a ton of surveys across more than 10,000 consumers all over the world. And more than half of the consumers tell us that they prefer to buy from local business whenever possible. The other thing that has happened is, you know, uh, going back to that first, you know, uh, when, when you and I fell in love over a campfire at Lake Tahoe, <laughs> someone else was there uh, with, with us. Uh, and, and he was part of that, that same group. It was, it was Blake from, from Tom's Shoes. Yep. And the reason that Tom's Shoes was so dramatic and so interesting was 
there was this incredible benevolency to the purchase. You voted with their wallet to buy these shoes. And as part of that vote, someone else who needs shoes also got a pair. And a lot of people uh, thought that was neat marketing and that was neat branding. But the truth is what that was exposing was this idea of conscious consumerism. And conscious consumerism is now no longer a niche thing that only very clever entrepreneurs use to create social good and social enterprise like Blake, but also it, it is now something that almost every consumer considers. They want to know, is the place, is the store, is the merchant, the brand they're buying from, do their values reflect my values? Do I see a connection between what I care about in the world and what they care about? And so when you couple this idea that we want to support local businesses, and that's not going anywhere, in fact, it's increasing, and the fact that we as consumers actually want to buy in a way that feels like conscious consumerism, uh, what you end up with is an entirely new way to purchase that actually is, is, you know, and this is sort of where you separate buying from shopping. Um, if, you know, there are people that they want to buy, you know, some toothpaste or they want to buy detergent, they may go to the quickest, most convenient place possible because it's almost like a commoditized purchase. It's a utility purchase. It's a transaction. That's all it is. It has no meaning to us. Um, but if they want to do some sort of shopping where they want to look at amazing new brands, they want to look at a catalog, they want to have an experience, they're almost always going to seek out more independent brands, more local brands, more brands that whose values reflect their own. And that is the paradigm shift that I'm describing, which we are never, ever going back uh, away from. This is the future of retail, what we're describing here. I was, uh, I got a, a moment of, I would describe it as chills, but just the fact to uh, folks at home, I wish you could have been there around that campfire, you know, with Toby and Harley and um, Blake, myself. It was a it was a really interesting and special, special time where if you could have been a fly on the wall, what you would have seen is the future of so many of these things that we now take for granted. And I think, you know, I'm just aware of the the capacity that each of us has to each of us have to, to truly affect the, the world. <laughs> like yeah. you're sitting there thinking about, or I'm, I'm just sitting there thinking about, and there's so many people right now who are listening and watching that this is a message. Like you don't, you know, you don't sure you could want to be a fly on that wall at that campfire, but you, that, that campfire is in your front room right now. That campfire is in your local community. The people that you were seated across the table, whether physically or virtually, are part of the next generation of the businesses. And you have your voice, your ideas. These things matter. I'm just looking back. And, and while there are you could say there are special things about each of us. There was also nothing special about that group. Just a bunch of people who are committed to innovating and trying and failing. And, and that's just like, you know, wherever you are right now at home in your underwear in Ohio or Ottawa or Ontario, or I don't know any more O-towns to name. <laughs> I just, but, but, but that's, but that also describes something that, that we've talked about before, which is this idea of building your own tribe, your, your own community, wherever you are, it can be virtual. It can be on the internet. It also can be in person. But one of the things that, that, you know, I, I, one of the things I've been very fortunate, I think you, you, you share this as well, Chase, that I've been able to find like-minded people on similar journeys in completely different venues and verticals and, and, and industries. But what we share together is this idea of a deep, deep frustration with the status quo yeah. um, and also this deep ambition for how do we make things much, much better. Um, and that's the reason to take this full circle that I think identity matters because one of the reasons that I think we were able to connect is you're like, well, hey, I'm Chase. I'm like, hey, I'm Harley. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur too. <laughs> we immediately became connected, even though you are far more, you know, you're a lot more creative than I am. You're far more right brain than I am. You think a lot more about makers and creation and, and the arts and photography. And I'm thinking about like, you know, software and technology. But where our, our Venn diagrams overlap is on this idea of ambition and, and being completely unsatisfied with what is currently in front of us. Um, that, I think, is such a neat thing. So true. And my man, you're everywhere right now. I, like you and Toby, I'm, like every podcast, uh, you're, you're, you've been on Mad Money with Kramer 
Like <laughs> every time I'm like, I don't know, I walk past a television somewhere <laughs> or whatever. I'm like, Hey, my man, I occasionally throw you a text hoping that it's in real time and you're going to, your phone is going to be buzzing in your pocket. <laughs> it, it often is in real time. It is, it is often in real time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but why is that? I mean, why is it just, is it the moment in time that we are at a tip? Is it a tipping point? Like what, you know, you stand yeah. for something and what uh, is it, what is it that you stand yeah. for? I don't think enough people understand the accessibility um, that is available today to do the thing you want to do, to find your life's work, to become an entrepreneur, to start that thing. And, you know, you we, we live, and I'm sure a lot of people listening, a lot of us live in these very entrepreneurial bubbles. I mean, if you know Creative Live, you know, you know, if you listen to Chase Jarvis, you're you're constantly hearing about incredible stories of of aspiration and inspiration. But remember that entrepreneurship still, it's not something that that feels accessible to most people. Yeah. And one of, you know, one of the things that I, I hope for Shopify is I, I think we have the opportunity to become the entrepreneur company. Um, there, there's no entrepreneur company. There's no company that, you know, if you think about search, now there's a, you know, there's one company that really has organized the world's data and made it easy to, to find, which is Google. And you think about social, there's a couple of companies doing it. You know, Facebook has certainly done one of the best jobs of that as well. Um, but there's a company that really owns the idea of connecting people in a, in, a, in a digital format. But there is no company that is the entrepreneurship company. And one of the benefits of us being um, larger and bigger and, and a little bit more well-known, and I say a little bit, not, not, to, not, to, not with any false modesty, but because in our, some circles, people know Shopify. And, and when I'm talking to communities of people that are very entrepreneurial and very, you know, care about small business, they've heard of Shopify. But most people do not know that this thing is available to them. And I see it all the time when I, I meet someone or someone sends me an email and says, I want to start a Shopify store, but I can't afford it. Or I don't know how to code. And I explain, well, first of all, um, there's this amazing trial to get just to play around. Also, it's $29. And also, if you know how to use email, you can build a business. And it's not even about Shopify per se. If they decide to go start a business on another platform, that is okay. This idea that more people become entrepreneurs, that there are more voices participating in this, in this journey of, of, of business creation... That I think is really important. And it's even more important now because whether you you believe Shopify is the entrepreneurship company or not, it's tough not to believe that the backbone of, of the recovery of this whole pandemic and that the future of business looks like small businesses. So I, I it would it would it would feel I, I wouldn't be doing justice to the mission if I didn't use every opportunity, and we didn't use every opportunity at Shopify to tell the story of the 1.7 million entrepreneurs on the platform, specifically those that didn't have a lot of money, that had no connections, had no network, didn't have you know well-to-do parents. Um, they were just regular people who decided that they wanted to share this thing with the world because they had this thing they wanted they wanted to put food on the table or they wanted to give their kids a family business to go into or they wanted to share their delicious chocolate with the world and, and that's the reason why we are trying to use all of these different ways do we have a, a tv show or a, excuse me a documentary that came out literally a week ago on disney plus it's called own the room and tells the story of like these young entrepreneurs i mean these are teenagers who start these businesses and they compete in the global entrepreneurship competition and it doesn't say Shopify once in the entire uh, documentary. And that's perfect okay for us because what we hope these documentaries on things like Disney will do is they will maybe inspire one more person to consider entrepreneurship. And then one more person may, may inspire two more people. And ultimately, if there are more entrepreneurs in the world, things are going to get better. Things will be a lot, um, it'll be a, a much better world for all of us to live in. I know that sounds very mother goose, but but that's true. Entrepreneurs do make things better in my in my view. Well, underscoring all of this is the concept of equity, right? And part of what, when the pandemic hit, well, Creative Live was like, well, we're in a position, I may perhaps a unique position to help people in this moment because they need skills now more than ever before. They need community now more than ever before. We made a bunch of health and wellness classes um, free in order to help, you know, mental health, physical health. People were, were trapped inside. And it occurred to me that that comes from a place of privilege. And here you and I are talking about it. Uh, 
ostensibly there it, it is privileged to be able to talk and think about this but how what what are you guys doing specifically around helping communities that are disproportionately affected by the pandemic i know we at creative live are are rushing to do everything we can and to learn as much as we can i'm just wondering if you have some ideas um, for those out there who are desiring to serve these communities you know what some of your ideas are how you guys are approaching this problem of access uh, to you know education services opportunity i mean clearly you've got a, a very accessible platform i'm just wondering what are some of the thought patterns that are happening inside of shopify that we might yeah. be able to learn from it's a great question. There's some very tangible ones. So we've now given out about $1.7 billion of loans to merchants on the platform. Now, again, I don't say that as a flex, I say that because these are traditionally people who could not walk into a bank and get a loan or a cash advance. And if they did, the rates would be astronomical because of the risk that, that, that these banks would be taking. And so things like Shopify Capital fundamentally put money into the pockets of these entrepreneurs on Shopify who could not get cap capital otherwise. And that, that, you know, that allows them to spend money on inventory and marketing and build that business even further. One of the things that I'm probably most proud of, well, actually two things. Um, we have this thing called the shop app. The shop app is this shopping assistant for consumers. It's any given day, top three or top five most popular shopping apps, uh, in, in every major app store. Um, and there are there are two tabs. There are two discovery tabs in that shop app. Uh, one app is uh, so you can discover local businesses in your community. So we just geolocate where you are as a consumer, and we will show you local businesses in your area where you can purchase from. And the second is black-owned businesses, where you can find businesses owned by black entrepreneurs. And the reason is, th like th their access is just it, it's simply different. And in order to level the playing field, you have to also understand what each playing field currently looks like. And so by doing so, we simply expose more consumers to more black businesses and more black business owners. The third thing that, that I think is, is uh, I'm, I'm probably most proud of is um, a couple of years ago, I met a guy named John Hope Bryant. He was creating Operation Hope. And we spoke a lot about this idea of, um, he was uh, sort of uh, banker of the year, but a very prominent figure in the African-American community based out of Atlanta. And his view is that financial literacy is, is a major, major catalyst for equality. And entrepreneurship and building a business is a major catalyst for, for equality. And so we created a program six months ago called 1MBB, 1 Million Black Businesses. And the entire goal is to create 1 million brand new Black-owned businesses on Shopify. And we do so by education. We do so by giving them resources. We also do so by creating these role models in different communities, particularly in the US, where one person who has built uh, a successful business as a Black entrepreneur is now able to act as a flywheel and a distribution channel for many others. And that idea that having more role models in a community creates more interest, and maybe I'll do that same thing as well. Um, we're probably not doing enough still, um, but we're doing things that we think can have a real impact. And 1 million Black Black businesses uh, is is one of the things that I'm most proud of. I joined the board of, of of that organization a couple of weeks ago because I just I felt so compelled to say this actually may create real change. And create change we must. Um, man, that was a fast hour. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Um, it was fun. I'm I'm really glad you invited me back on, Chase. No, it just the landscape has changed so much. The opportunities are so ripe. The amount of um, I think they just sort of like pent up, what should I do with this next chapter? So many people are this introspection and fuel and motivation and empathy. And can, there's so much in the like brewing right now that we have to do what we can to get it out. So I, you know, I think we talked right when the pandemic hit and I said, how's business? And <laughs> you're like, man, it's hard to, it's hard to really compare what this, the, the, the opportunity amidst so much pain. Yeah. Uh, and, and so thank you for coming. There's, there's a bit, there's a bittersweetness to it. Right. And I think yeah. one thing that, that everyone listening and watching can take away is that we've had a tidal wave happen. This tidal wave was COVID, you know, COVID-19 and it happened and it was big and it was impactful and, and, it, and, and it, it, it ruined a lot of people, a lot of lives. But what you saw is you saw two different types of, of reactions. You saw one reaction, which was grab your towel and run to the shore and wait for the tidal wave to, to go back to sea. But you also saw these incredible stories of resiliency and adaptability where people just grab their surfboard. And I think that 
you know, hopefully there are no major COVID type pandemics that happen again in the next while. But as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a creator, as, as a, as anyone, as, as someone that cares about having cr creating value in the world, you're going to see tons of these tidal waves continuously come at you. And you have that choice. You can wait for the, t the wave to go away and you can wait for the status quo to return, or you can grab that surfboard. And you talked about restaurants at the beginning of this chat. Some of those restaurants, they stopped being restaurants. They realized their job is not to create in you know dining experiences inside. Their job was to feed their consumer with delicious food, or it was to create hospitality, or it was to create a feeling of warmth and connection. And when you, when you play with what is the value you're creating given this new tidal wave, some people are not, uh, not only able to survive it, but as you said, they're able to thrive. No better way to end a conversation than that. That's an exclamation point. What's the best way for people to, uh, where, where are some coordinates that you would steer us listening and watching right now? Of course, you're, I think you're Harley F. Most I'm Harley F on Twitter. I'm at Harley on Instagram. Uh, and of course, Shopify.com is where you can find a lot of stuff. Um, and if you want to watch Chase and I banter about all types of stuff, uh, you know, hijacking one of our conversations on Twitter is always a really <laughs> great way to do that. So yeah, we welcome your engagement and Harley, man, thanks so much. Congratulations yeah, on the you. success you've created for yourself and those in, in uh, the Shopify family, but also the more than 1.7 million businesses out there that you are uh, empowering. So I want to say thank you personally. And uh, until next time, everybody out there in the world, um, good luck keeping your universe driving and thriving. And we're here for you. If you need anything, reach out on social. Until next time, I bid you all adieu.